Welcome to District Dialogues. I am Marvin Arrington, Jr., Fulton County Commissioner, representing District 5. District 5 encompasses parts of the new city of South Fulton, Southwest and Southeast Atlanta, East Point, Union City, and College Park. Some of the great landmarks in District 5 include Zoo Atlanta, the former Fort McPherson, which is now home to Tyler Perry's new movie studio, the Porsche headquarters, Camp Creek Marketplace, and my favorite, the Wolf Creek Amphitheater. During this show, we hope to share information about organizations, initiatives, and resources in District 5 and throughout Fulton County in areas where I champion for Fulton County. So let's get straight to it. I am a proud member of the Justice and Public Safety Committee for the National Association of Counties, also known as NACO. In our Justice and Public Safety segment, we like to share information from our partners that provide resources and information about justice and public safety. Please meet Reginald Crosley, Fulton County Youth Commissioner Coordinator, Department of Community Development and Office of Children and Youth. Welcome to the show, Reginald. Thank you for having me, Commissioner Arrington. Always great to have you. Yes, pleasure. So, uh, if you will, tell our audience about the Fulton County Youth Commission. Yes, absolutely. The Fulton County Youth Commission program was founded in 1999 as a board resolution to give youth a voice in government. So these young people um, use Fulton County as an outlet to voice their opinions on solutions they feel are fitting um, for challenges that young people throughout Fulton County are faced with. And... How are the students selected, or how does a student get chosen to participate in the Fulton County Youth Commission? Well, I'd first like to explain Fulton County um, has students that represent each respective district. So young people come in and they serve essentially as elected officials for those districts. So what we do is we go into the schools, we um, work with the school counselors, we work with the principals, um, we work with our superintendents, and we ensure that all schools throughout Fulton County are aware of the application process. So we look for students who are freshmen through 11th grade. We do not accept seniors as first year youth commissioners, but you can become a senior while in the program. I uh, also want to mention we're not an academic based program. So students simply apply to the program and we look for young people with an interest in community um, who simply want to serve as a voice within their community who want to be civically engaged. Uh, many of our applicants inspire to be elected officials, attorneys, um, they're debaters within their schools. So those are the types of young people we look for, but we're not limited to those areas I just mentioned. We're simply young people who want to give a voice or serve as a voice in their communities. And um, we're not an academic-based program. You just simply apply to the program. You submit a two-page essay. Um, you also submit a letter of recommendation from a school leader or civic leader okay. and um, they're interviewed. So how, what, I guess two questions, what is the total number of youth commissioners that you have in any one time or every year and then what is some of the work that they do? What, you know, you said you're not an academic based organization, so what do they actually do? Absolutely. So currently we have 31 youth commissioners, five in each commission district, and one student that serves at large. So he serves as the actual chairman of the youth commission um, group. So we model the actual board of commissioners. We meet on the same schedule. Um, we use Robert rule of um, order for our meetings. So we govern ourselves, again, as a mirror of the actual board of commissioners. So um, students are working on a wide range of things. And again, as I mentioned, um, they go into their communities and they host focus groups and think tanks and they identify the issues within those communities and in turn bring them back to the group and then we create the solutions. So what we have found is that opioids and drug um, usage in the schools seem to be at the top of the list in the surveys that we conduct within the school. So we've designed an initiative entitled Not Even Once, uh, which is a drug prevention workshop that we go into the schools and we facilitate um, I myself, I'm a drug, uh, certified drug prevention specialist, so along with my youth commissioners, we co-facilitate workshops around those topics. Um, so it's like a peer-to-peer -peer type of um, delivery on right. um, the, the health um, consequences, the, the um, 
consequences for possession, for distribution of those drugs. So we touch on a wide range of things. We bring a professional drug kit within the classroom so they get to see live visuals of those drugs. We um, bring like DUI goggles and we do hands-on simulations. Um, we, um, you know, we do a wide range of things to ensure that they understand the consequences and the health effects for consuming those sorts of drugs. So in addition to that, we're doing um, a lot around college and career development. We're actually launching a college and career guide um, for this coming school year. So giving young people a roadmap from freshman year to senior year and into college and career. Um, we're launching an app to go along with this college and career guide. Uh, awesome. We're launching a drug app as well. Um, we're doing work around homelessness, life skills, um, you know, a wide range of things that we understand for a fact that these young people need because our agenda is developed off of the um, think tanks and the surveys and the things that we conduct within the school. So we know we're spot on on what the need is. And on average, we may survey um, 10,000 students to identify our agenda for the year. So um, that peer-to-peer -peer involvement, I think, is very crucial uh, as you talk about presenting those things, letting them hear it from their, their own peers. Uh, I'm sure is very helpful. Uh, tell us about the Summer Youth Internship Program. Yes, we recently launched a Summer Youth Internship Program, and thank you to your advocacy, we were able to make that happen. And um, we have teens and um, young adults who are ages 16 to 24 who get a chance to shadow professionals in a wide range of fields. Um, we are doing everything from tech to um, law to um, corporate entities, so young people get a chance to work with 60 different entities, um, intergovernmental departments and corporate partners who help them gain soft skills and employability skills and um, just all around um, skills that they can apply to the workforce. And how many children were able to get jobs this, this summer as a result of the Summer Youth Internship Program? We have program? 141 students selected and we have 60 different employers. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, I really love the fact that you guys are doing those apps. Um, that sounds real interesting. I think that's going to be a great way to pull children in. Um, are there any other things that you want to share with us uh, regarding the Fulton County Division of Children and Youth Services? Yes, we're doing some great and exciting things, and the Youth Commission um, has a pulse of our community. And these students represent every district within Fulton County. Um, you know, they, they go to the schools within those respective districts, so they understand firsthand on what the needs are. Um, something that we've also been doing, and we've been getting requests from um, Fulton County Schools administrators and Atlanta Public School administrators are training those um, admin staff within the schools, um, helping them understand the code language as it relates to drug use and, you know, just the slang that our young people are using out there right now. So we're tr actually facilitating workshops with it students are training the teachers and principals wow. and counselors so that has been a great opportunity um, to get our message across but in ensuring that our frontline administrators and teachers understand how to best address the issues that they're faced with in the schools sounds like we're gonna have to get these youth commissioners a raise they, they're doing a lot of good work out there <laughs> yes, and uh, we're gonna have to find a better way to reward them thank you for all that you do with our youth commissioners I know you've been working with them for a while and uh, you've done a tremendous job uh, so I just want to personally thank you for uh, going above and beyond the call of duty. Um, I see you down in Savannah and driving all over the state with them. So uh, yes. I, I know you put in the extra time. Thank you, Commissioner, for being a champion and just for being there when we need you and um, helping get our agenda across. We'll be right back with our D5 Spotlight. Stay with us. In our D5 Spotlight, we give recognition to organizations and individuals who are striving to empower our community and our county. Our next guest is Michael Davis, the Executive Director of Connect South Fulton. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you, Commissioner. So, what is Connect South Fulton? Well, Connect South Fulton is a public-private partnership between uh, my organization and the seven cities in South Fulton County. Much like the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
these cities decided that it was they can get more done if they band together to compete against um, Gwinnett Cobb as an area, because after all, we have the world's largest airport in the middle of South Fulton. And why was Connect South Fulton founded? It, it, was, it was founded because, I mean, I, back to the proverb, you know, each of the cities, I think, does a great job. Chattahoochee Hills, College Park, East Point, Fairburn, Hapeville, Palmetto Union City. But they realized that even with their distinctiveness, they were stronger together. So really it's about collaboration and um, having someone like myself and my organization work regionally to go out, brand, and advocate for us beyond the cities um, all over Metro Atlanta and even globally. Well, I think those collaborative efforts are always helpful and really make sense and like you say, gives them an opportunity to, uh, because they're smaller cities, it gives them an mm -hmm. opportunity to band together and, and pitch as one, so that makes perfect sense. Um, what are the strategic goals? and what, what is the vision of this group? What, what are they trying to get accomplished? Well, there's really a handful of strategic, strategic goals. I mean, first off, the vision to step back is to position South Fulton as a region as the premier place for capital investment in Georgia, right? So we need to change the narrative so it's the most attractive place to invest. So c cultivate investment. Uh, the second one is really to champion business, new business, business expansion, and to really help with those small businesses and improve the retention levels. So the businesses that start here, thrive here, and stay here. And then uh, after that, it's about community development. We're working in public safety, we're working in transportation, blight, code enforcement, and then also uh, talent development. Uh, we got to have the, the most t trained, talented people in the areas like instruction and film and technology. So when employers look to, to bring headquarters there, do you have 5,000 of this? We can check the box and say yes. And then lastly, public policy, working with people like yourself and people in their state delegation to really be sure we're creating policies that can, that can help us sustain and grow strong economic development that leads to good quality of life. And I know you mentioned some of those cities earlier, but what are all the cities that are involved in supporting Connect South Fulton? Sure. Um, in the very, very end of the county, we've got Chattahoochee Hills uh, with Serenby, a great development, College Park, East Point, the city of Fairburn, Hapeville, um, city of Palmetto, and then lastly, Union City. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and so what is the most significant initiative uh, that either that you're planning or that you've already undertaken as, as Connect South Fulton? Well, you know, the, these cities have, have great vision, so we're very ambitious. So we've, we've actually, the biggest thing we've worked on, and we've worked with your office on, and we appreciate your help, is the Community Connect program. I mean, I think the most important thing now is to have uh, safe public spaces that welcome people. So we've rolled out in the cities of East Point, College Park, and in Hapeville, this program where businesses or property owners and shopping centers can share their video directly in the cloud to police. So police have the, can have that real time. So if you make a call, the police can have it on their phone and do stuff real time. Because the biggest challenge our, our business owners have is uh, with these negative incidents that happen is, I gotta get the video, it may take a couple of days. This gets the, the information the police need as soon as they can. And it also puts them in a position where they can speed up the investigation and, and make an apprehension. So with that, We've had our first arrest with that program recently, and we're, we're gonna celebrate that uh, yeah. for two reasons. One, to let the community know that we're working proactively to have clean, excuse me, safe public spaces that are welcoming, but also let the people that are bad people know that we're coming for them and we're using technology because we insist that our community, communities are safe and we insist that our, our citizens have a great quality of life in South Fulton County. Yeah. So that's probably the first initiative we've worked on. There's other things that we're doing, but that's the biggest one. The other thing, if I have a moment, is we're working on something called good neighbor zoning. So I've, I've partnered with the zoning experts over at Denton's, and you know, in a lot of our municipalities with annexations, we've got borders that are like yeah. zigzag. Yeah. So you've got on one city, you've got a residential, and on the other side, you've got like an industrial or commercial. We're working on a proposal now with our cities to have intergovernmental agreements and an overlay where we have a set of design standards at a minimum that they can work together, each city, to actually work on each zoning specifically. So we're now meeting with the planners to define the minimums, and Denton's has guided us with a brilliant vision for how we can do this, because that's the challenge you have with annexations. 
you, you have these borders which don't match. Right. And then what we can do is work for these situations so for setbacks and lighting and water have a minimum and they can work together to not only make it work but even go beyond the boundary go to, to go further so it works on one side and works on another and it's, it's a, sort of a good neighbor zoning policy we're rolling out. No, I love that. You know, we just, uh, I just passed a resolution or got the commission to pass the resolution that mm -hmm. I introduced uh, which asked for a hundred foot natural tree buffer uh, between any commercial or industrial mm -hmm. projects and residential projects on those same border lines. Mm -hmm. So um, I will certainly do whatever I can to help you from that side. And, and frankly, really, we need to maybe get with our state representatives, uh, Bodie and Bruce and, uh, and others, uh, to talk about how do we make that state law because that's not just something happening here. Correct. That's something that's happening here, but it really should apply statewide. And so, well, and, and the beauty of this is, and I think you know this with with your tenure is one set of zoning. There's no silver bullet for zoning. So what we're doing for the planners is creating a set of tools, the framework to protect it in minimum, so they can adjust it. Because in one area you may need 100 feet but another area you can't do it, so it's 50. So right. it maybe because it work together cooperatively. So I'm meeting with the city managers and the planners in each of the cities to define what the minimums are. And then we'll put that into the overlay as a set of tools they can use, because you know, right. every situation is unique. Well, with, with well what too. it sounds like is a true comprehensive land use plan, because each of the cities typically have their own comprehensive land use plans, as you stated, mm -hmm. that don't necessarily coincide along those borders. Exactly. Uh, and so the effort that you're undertaking really is coming up with a true comprehensive plan which affects not only one city but any other city in which it, uh, it, it borders. So that it's, it's awesome. And the, the great thing, Commissioner, is that all of the mayors were unanimously for this, this is a high priority because this is really a quality of life issue. Awesome, awesome. Uh, tell us briefly about the uh, Princeton, the new Princeton Lakes walking trail. Well, one, um, it's fantastic. I mean, Princeton Lakes, for those that don't know, it's a 25 acre lake right behind Cam Creek Marketplace. And for those that don't know Cam Creek Marketplace, you're looking at logically on less than two million square feet of retail and shopping and hospitality. We have the unique uh, thing we, we have an area that's it's now managed we've got a walking trail around it um, um, they're offering um, for the youth they'll be offering free jet ski classes there's a jet ski there they're gonna be bringing in play equipment and exercise equipment so we're gonna have a true amenity in the midst of a shopping area which no one I don't think has in Metro Atlanta and and th working with the commissioner we're we're gonna get work with public safety and get cameras and lighting so that we know that we can have our families our seniors and have events there and they can be safe. So we're excited, the Atlanta, Atlanta folks are excited, East Point, College Park, City of South Fulton, all the communities, we have four communities that, that live and work here. Mm -hmm. And we're all excited because we don't have many like this near any major shopping center. Well, um, I would thank you so much for your work and getting that done. That, that might be one of your, your, your best initiatives, even though you mentioned the other one, but uh, certainly, hopefully there'll be many more to come. It is. I need to acknowledge uh, Reginald, some of the folks, I mean, the folks at the NPU were a great partner and they've driven the bus. We had to go to the city of Atlanta to get legislation passed. So the city of Atlanta, uh, Mayor Bottoms, yes. uh, when she was a commissioner, helped get that passed. So if anyone wants to use that for, like if you want to use that for a uh, community event, all you need to do is go to the city of Atlanta, do a special use permit, and you can have public access to that space. Oh, wow. So I want to acknowledge the mayor and the NPU, their parks leader, because yes. uh, they had great vision. I was, in a former life, I was president of the Camp Creek Business Association. So this is a multi-year journey, and well, I'm really glad to see the ribbon cutting last month. Well, we thank you for all your dedication and getting it done. Uh, we're glad to have you here with us today, Michael. Uh, keep up the great work with Connect South Fulton. Stay with us for our arts and culture segment. I'm the proud executive sponsor of Arts and Culture in Fulton County. I also serve as the Vice Chair of the Atlanta Fulton County Recreation Authority and as a member of the Commission for the National Association uh, of Counties, or NACO. As such, I'd like to share with you arts and culture organizations and programs in Fulton County. 
Today, please meet Mrs. Kathleen Bertrand, executive producer of the Bronze Land Film Festival. Welcome to the show, Kathleen. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's been quite a journey, huh? Oh my goodness, this is the ninth year. Yeah, so I remember when when, when, when you were first starting. That's and, right. Uh, it was just a, a whisper of a thought. Yeah, yes. so it is, but it has come a long way in those nine years. You have done a tremendous job in Thank building you. a great brand. Thank you very much. We're very excited about the opportunities that we've had to uplift filmmakers from uh, the Atlanta area as well as filmmakers from all over the country. So so tell our, our listeners, listening audience, viewing audience, um, what is the Bronze Lens Film Festival? Bronze Lens Film Festival was created in 2010 and we are a platform for filmmakers and other content creators of color who come to show their films, to network with other persons in production, both in film and television, and really find out more about how to do what they do better, as well as to elevate the content that they already have. Well, we've seen, um, and thank you for that work, it's so important, and we've seen how the film industry has grown yes. here in Atlanta yes. and frankly throughout the state of Georgia. That's right. Um, you know, what, what do you attribute that growth to? Directly to the tax incentive, <laughs> directly, because so many people that could have shot films elsewhere are bringing that to Atlanta, but I think uh, growth begets growth. So because so many people are coming, other people that may not have even looked at Atlanta or Georgia are starting to pay attention and take notice. And of course the film incentive, film incentive tax incentive, has a great deal of uh, leverage for the things that they want to do in Atlanta. But additionally, I think Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport is also one of our greatest assets because the connections are nonstop from so many places in the country if they want to bring people from LA or if we want to go to other cities um, New York, uh, Chicago, wherever it might be, everything is nonstop from Atlanta. And so I think that's another one of our great assets. And then the final great asset I think we have that makes a difference is the great Southern hospitality that we have in this city and this state. We're used to welcoming people from all over the world. And I think people feel that great hospitality when they come here. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. And Certainly that tax incentive doesn't hurt. Doesn't uh, hurt. For those that don't know, there's a 30% state tax credit, dollar for dollar state tax mm -hmm. credit uh, for those that invest uh, into film and other creative industries because they've expanded it now. That's right. Uh, it's a whole new market. So 30% um, dollar for dollar tax credit. Can't be. Uh, it. It is, in fact, <laughs> it is the, the best tax credit in the country, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think you're right, one of, one of the many reasons uh, we've seen so much growth. Uh, tell us some of the highlights um, that are anticipated for this year's annual festival. Absolutely. One of the highlights that we have, we started a few years ago, it's called Sunday Brunch with the Brothers. And that's the Sunday of the film festival when we ask for men that are in the industry, whether they be actors or producers. So taking from in front of the screen and behind the, behind the lens. And uh, we bring them together for a panel to just kind of talk about their perspective as men of color in an industry like the entertainment industry, film and television. We also have a great event uh, called the Women's Superstars Luncheon. We started that our very first year, and this is the ninth year doing that, where we honor women that have been doing just great work in film and television over the years, but have been unheralded. So many fabulous producers, and now you hear so much about directors, but all kinds of people behind the scenes, as well as the legendary people that you co you've come to know. And we honor them at the Women's Superstars Luncheon. We've got a director's conversation that we do every year, where we really have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, a director of note to just kind of talk about his or her journey. We also have a student session on the Saturday morning of the festival weekend, we spend time with a student track where the program is, is exclusively dedicated to the students so that they have a chance to kind of drill down on what they might want to do in the industry. And the best part of all is that we show over 60 films, uh, content created by filmmakers from all over the country and all over the world, features, documentaries, short films, webisodes, 
music videos. We show it all during the course of the weekend at Bronze Lens. Well, I, I have watched your growth from year to year and uh, very excited about all the great things. I know that luncheon is always uh, Huge. sold out. It's, yes. I know it's always sold out. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, and so, so so you don't need to be a filmmaker or in the film industry no. to to come to the Bronze Lens Film Festival. Not at all. Bronze Lens not only gives an opportunity for filmmakers, but for people that are interested in film and for people that just love coming to see films. So we run film all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, and half of Sunday of the Bronze Lens weekend. And so anybody that comes has a chance to step in and see brand new content that is just coming out right now and it's premiering at Bronze Lens. We always get excited about the fact that we have so many films <clears throat> that come that have never been seen before by the public. So if I'm a filmmaker, how can I get my film screened at the Bronze Lens Film Festival? Bronze Lens does have a submission process. The submission process actually ended in April for this year's festival. So we will start again uh, the latter part of the year with opening for submissions. And once a film is, submission, is uh, submitted, we have a portal through which they submit their film. The film is judged. And then we announce what the official selections are. And that those are the films that are shown at the film festival each year. So as a filmmaker, even if you have not, don't have a film that was submitted, we always feel it's good to come because the networking is tremendous. We've had filmmakers to come and they create their crew for their next project based on people with skills that they met at Bronze Lens Film Festival. So we really like the, the caliber of people that come to the festival. So if you're a filmmaker and you don't yet have your project, come to Bronze Lens and see who's doing what, how they're doing it, and how that can help you do what you want to do. All right, and, yeah. and, and if they're lucky, they might get to hear you sing. Huh? Might, might, <laughs> won't promise. <laughs> Well, thank you again for all the work that you have done in promoting film and the arts in Fulton County. And we're certainly thankful uh, for that and appreciative of everything that you have done to further that through the Bronze Lens Film Festival. Thank you, Commissioner. And we want to be uh, make sure that we thank you as well, because you've always been a film supporter. We also want to thank the Fulton County Arts Council for the support of Bronze Lens Film Festival, because without our supporters, we couldn't make it year to year. You know, running a film festival is a really tight budget. Yeah. So you've got to have every, every single dollar of support that you can. So just know that we're very grateful for that. Awesome. As we wrap up today's show, I'd like to invite you to stay connected with my office. You can reach us by phone, email, website, and through social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching District Dialogues. We'll see you next time.